Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. I have had Louis Wayne on my list for an episode for a while. He was a commercial illustrator and popular artist who's most well-known for his many depictions of cats. We've had some listener requests for an episode on him as well, and most recently on Twitter, listener Theodore asked if we had done one. Uh, We had not, but that bumped him up to the top of the list. Louis Wayne's art was extremely popular in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, especially in the UK, and some of his later work also became an inspiration for the psychedelic movement of the 1960s. Sometimes that later work is also interpreted as documenting the progression of his mental illness, although there are some problems with that interpretation that we will be talking about. In the language of the time, Louis Wayne was declared insane in 1924, and he spent the last 15 years of his life living in asylums and psychiatric hospitals. But while he was there, he continued to create artwork that whole time. Louis William Wayne was born on August 5, 1860, in Clerkenwell, London. His father, William, was an embroiderer and textile trader who had been disowned by his family after converting to Catholicism. Louis's mother, Julie Felicie Boiteau, was the daughter of French immigrants to the UK, and she usually went by Felicia Marie among English speakers. She also worked in textiles, designing things like embroideries, carpets, and altar cloths for the Catholic Church. Louis was their oldest child, named after his maternal grandfather, and he had five younger sisters. Carolyn, Josephine, Marie, Claire, and Julie, also known as Felicie. Louis was born with a cleft lip, and that's something that was probably treated with surgery while he was still a baby. As an adult, he grew a mustache to conceal it. When he was very young, a doctor advised his parents to have him taught at home rather than sending him to school, although they never told him specifically why that was. He was frequently sick, though. He had a serious case of scarlet fever, among other things, and he also described having particularly vivid dreams and nightmares that could be really troubling to him. When Louis was 10, his parents decided that he was ready to go to school. But he really did not like it. He was bright and curious with a particular interest in electricity and magnetism, and he loved going to scientific lectures at the Royal Polytechnic Institution, which later became the University of Westminster. But when it came to his actual classwork, it just didn't hold his interest. He was also shy, and his classmates found him to be a little odd, so he struggled to connect to his peers, and he sometimes got into fights. For most of his youth, he regularly skipped school and went to wander the countryside around London, immersing himself in observations of nature. When Louis was 13, he was enrolled at Joseph's Academy in Kennington, which had started out as a village south of London and is considered part of London today. He continued to skip school, but he also started developing some new interests, including chemistry, boxing, art, and music. For a while, he wanted to write an opera, and he thought that he might make a career in music. He gradually started focusing most of his time on music and art and eventually decided to become an artist. He enrolled at West London School of Art in 1877 and studied there for four years. On October 27, 1880, William Wayne died, leaving Louis as the primary breadwinner for his mother and sisters. He tried his hand at teaching, becoming an assistant master at his art school, but that only lasted for a year. He was just so shy that he had a hard time effectively instructing his students. At the end of 1881, Wayne published his first piece of artwork, which was a picture of bullfinches on a laurel bush that was in Illustrated Sporting and Dramatic News. At this point, most newspapers and magazines that wanted to include some kind of visual imagery were relying mostly on illustrations. Although various types of photography had been invented, a cost-effective method to rapidly print photos onto paper had not. There were, however, more commercially available methods to print illustrations, 
Publications that printed a lot of illustrations usually worked with multiple illustrators, some of them on staff and some of them freelance. And Louis Wayne was particularly suited for this kind of work. Number one, he could draw images that were accurate and visually appealing, and he could do that really quickly. He was also good at some of the subjects that newspapers and readers really wanted, like drawing all of the winning animals at livestock and agricultural fairs or detailed illustrations of people's country homes. Soon, Wayne had a staff position at Illustrated Sporting and Dramatic News, and he supplemented his income by doing portraits of people's dogs. When Louis was 23, he started a relationship with Emily Marie Richardson, who was 10 years older than he was. She was living and working at the Wayne family home as a governess and tutor to Louis's youngest sisters. His family really did not approve of this relationship at all, both because of the difference in their ages and because of her position in their household and in society. Louis and Emily got married in spite of those objections on January 30th, 1884 at St. Mary's Chapel, Hampstead. No one from either of their families attended the wedding. Their witnesses were Matilda Humphreyson and Louis's longtime friend, artist and illustrator Herbert Railton. We mentioned earlier that Louis had a hard time making friends at school, but while he was still thought of as eccentric and maybe a little odd, he did have more friends in his adulthood. After getting married, Emily, Louis, and their pet bird lived in a little house in Hampstead, and soon they also got a black and white kitten named Peter. It's not totally clear where Peter came from. He eventually became part of the sort of lore surrounding Louis Wayne and his love of cats, and multiple people took credit for giving him to the couple. Regardless of how Peter came into their lives, though, he was deeply beloved. It seems just as likely that Peter just wandered up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's one of the many possibilities. Peter could claim credit for giving Peter to them. <laughs> yes. Sadly, though, not long after their marriage, Emily was diagnosed with breast cancer, and soon she was spending most of her time in bed with Peter and Louis for company. Sometimes Louis is characterized as abandoning everything else so that he could spend time with his dying wife, but he was still trying to earn enough money to support them both. And he did much of this by traveling to agricultural shows, fishing competitions, and other events by train, and drawing as many illustrations as he could as quickly as he could, some of them while on the train traveling back home. Emily's sister also came to help take care of her, although she and Louis did not always get along. When he wasn't working, though, Louis really did spend as much time as he could with Emily and Peter, including teaching Peter tricks and drawing pictures of him, all to just try to entertain his wife. And Emily really loved these pictures. Louis had started working for the Illustrated London News, and Emily encouraged him to show the pictures to his editor, Sir William Ingram. Louis was reluctant at first. Cats didn't have the kind of popular appeal that they do in a lot of places today. There were certainly people in the UK who kept cats as pets or even bred them. But as one example, the first Crystal Palace show, which was the first cat show in the country, had taken place only about 15 years earlier. And to a lot of people, cats were somewhere between an unwanted nuisance and a necessary but dirty way to control rats and mice. Wayne later said of this, quote, When I first started sketching and painting cats, they were viewed as detested creatures, looked upon as pests by hunters. Anyone who was interested in the cat movement was seen to be effeminate. Wayne did finally show Ingram his pictures of Peter, though, and it turns out Ingram really liked them. Louis Wayne published his first cat picture in the Illustrated London News in 1884, this was a full-page spread of 14 pictures called Our Cats, A Domestic History. These were realistically drawn cats doing real-life cat things like getting into a sewing basket, scratching themselves under the chin with a back paw, drinking from a saucer, and catching a mouse. The panels formed a loose narrative with the captions at the bottom describing a cat who was patterned after Peter, he was forgotten at home while the family goes to the seaside and then gets into so much mischief that she's no longer fit to be shown at the Crystal Palace Cat Show. In the mid-1880s, Louis Wayne's work as an illustrator included pictures of lots of different animals, architectural drawings, some work as a commercial artist on product packaging, and 
increasingly cats. In 1886, he was commissioned to illustrate a children's book called Madame Tabby's Establishment. He created seven full-page illustrations featuring lots and lots of cats, as well as the book's protagonist, a little girl named Diana. In the book, the king of cats had belonged to Diana's grandmother, which meant that Diana was allowed to join cat society and go to Madame Tabby's, basically a finishing school for cats. After this, Wayne asked William Ingram if he could do a cat illustration for Christmas for the Illustrated London News. Ingram agreed, and the result was a kitten's Christmas party, which took him 11 days to complete. Like Our Cats, A Domestic History, this was a set of pictures that formed a narrative, this time over 11 panels, and in those panels were about 150 total cats. They're not wearing human clothes, but some of them are doing human activities, including washing the dishes, playing in a musical ensemble, and sleeping in a bed the way children often do in picture books. So on their backs with heads on pillows and front paws tucked over the top of a folded down bedspread. Eventually, Wayne's cat illustrations would become a Christmas time staple. In The Book of the Cat, published in 1903, Frances Simpson wrote, quote, A Christmas without one of Louis's clever catty pictures would be like Christmas pudding without currants. Sadly, Louis's wife Emily died on January 2nd, 1887, not long after A Kitten's Christmas Party was published, and just a couple of days after their third wedding anniversary. Louis, of course, was heartbroken. He and Peter moved into a new home where Louis kept on drawing cats. And we'll talk about a shift in Louis's cat art and where it went from there after we pause for a sponsor break. In 1890, Louis Wayne's Christmas illustration for the Illustrated London News included something that people came to see as really emblematic of his work. The cats weren't just doing human activities like washing dishes. They were also highly anthropomorphized and dressed in human clothes. He did keep creating more realistic depictions of cats, as well as cats in various human-like scenarios who were not wearing clothes, but cats in Victorian and Edwardian attire became a big part of his work. He later described his process as sometimes involving drawing the people he saw around him, but drawing them as cats. Louis Wayne's fame and popularity grew over the next few years, and so did the number of cats in his household. Most of the time, he had more than one, and by some counts, the number was sometimes as high as 17. Some of these were cats that people gave to him as gifts, knowing how much he loved them, but other times it was more like someone had found a stray and just assumed he would be okay with taking it in. But Peter was really at the heart of a lot of his work and was the model for a lot of his pictures. After Emily died, Peter was Louis's closest companion until his death in March of 1898. By then, Louis Wayne had become a household name. And in addition to publishing so many pictures of cats, he was also writing a lot about cats and their care based on his own experience and intuition. Some of this more or less holds up. Like he said that cats hated orange peels and could be kept away from the garden by burying orange peels near the plants. He also recommended keeping some grass on hand for a cat, even if it was just a little bit of grass growing in a pot. Those are things you still hear today. Sure, my cats hate the smell of citrus and will turn and run if I hold out a peel toward them. I think I could produce multiple behavior books that say, if you have tomcats lingering outside your house marking your doors, just rub a little orange peel around the, the door frame. <laughs> Works like a charm. Uh, but some of his cat advice was downright cockamamie. Wayne didn't just think that having a pet cat was good for a person's spirit. He claimed that people who kept cats were physically immune to various minor illnesses. At some points, he described cats as having weak minds, although he always said that Peter was extremely intelligent. When asked how cats who wandered far from home could find their way back if their minds were so weak, he said it was because their bodies had an electrical polarity that told them which way was north. 
Because he was such a tireless promoter of cats, and because he, at least theoretically, had a lot of expertise about them and their care, Louis Wayne was made president of the National Cat Club in 1891. I feel like we might get emails from people that point out various animals that do use some kind of electrical or polarity. Right. So that was not what he was describing. <laughs> Uh, It was really like this cat is a literal electrical compass. It did not really add up. However, Louis Wayne's cat pictures and writing about cats were published all over the place and collected into books. He illustrated children's books, some of which he also wrote, and he kept working for various illustrated newspapers and magazines. But he was not able to turn all of this fame and prolific output into a reliable income he didn't copyright his images, so people just reprinted them if they wanted to. That was something that became a bigger and bigger problem as his career went on and there was more and more of his work already out there. When he sold illustrations to publications, a lot of the time he just sold them outright. He didn't retain his rights to the original image or negotiate for any kind of royalties or licensing fees for later use of the artwork. He also just didn't charge a lot for it. It came easily to him, and he loved doing these pictures, so it just doesn't seem to have occurred to him that he should ask for more money. And there were definitely publishers who absolutely took advantage of him for this. They recognized they had access to this illustrator whose output was prolific and whose work was really cheap. And really popular. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, In 1895, Louis seems to have reconciled with his mother and sisters, and he moved in with them in a house owned by William Ingram in Westgate-on-Sea in Kent. He made ends meet, but just barely, by selling art, often using artwork to barter for things like the rent and even basic necessities. Since they didn't have a lot of money, their lives were fairly quiet, and his sisters never really had any suitors. But Louis also tended to buy luxuries that they didn't necessarily need and couldn't really afford. Like at one point, he had a telephone installed, and he also had notepaper printed that had their telephone number up at the top. This might not sound all that frivolous, but for context, in 1895, there were only 9,000 telephone subscribers in all of London, which had a population of well over 4 million people, Two years later, that was up to a whopping 17,371 subscribers. They did not really need a phone. There was almost nobody to call. He's just handing out his phone number, magical notepads to to cats. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And the family did have some other struggles as well. Louis' sister Marie had been experiencing delusions, including a persistent belief that she had Hansen's disease, also known as leprosy, and that meant that she refused to let people get near her. In 1901, she was declared insane and admitted to a hospital where she was diagnosed with primary dementia. Some sources have concluded that this was really schizophrenia. The first Louis Wayne Annual came out in 1901. This was a book collecting written work by Louis Wayne and by other people, some of them friends of his, along with lots of his illustrations. A new annual came out nearly every year until 1915, with the last one published a few years after that. Louis' creative output was particularly prolific at the start of the 20th century. He was producing as many as 600 works of art per year, some of them depicting multiple cats or other animals. He worked with as many as 75 publishers over the course of his life, and he worked in multiple media, including pen and ink, oil, watercolor, gouache, Venetian red chalk, silver point, pencil, and crayon. His biggest publishing year for children's books was 1903, and that year he published 11 different books. Over the years, he also did some political cartoons. His political views could be as eccentric as some of his opinions on things like cats and electricity, and when he wrote about political subjects, he could be kind of discursive and rambly. I had a hard time reading these and sort of distilling down what his general point was. 
Generally, though, he was a capitalist and a royalist. He believed in the idea of free trade. He was also generally supportive of the colonialism of the British Empire, but also frustrated by the unjust treatment of the poor, the sick, and immigrants. He also published letters to the editor of various publications, often about things that annoyed him in some way. As one example... Children during the Christmas season caroling door-to-door or soliciting subscriptions, which he described as a begging errand. He had kind of a complicated train of thought on this, simultaneously pointing out the conditions of poverty and deprivation that led to children needing to beg or sing for money, but also passing judgment on the people who were experiencing that kind of poverty. So Wayne's sometimes scornful descriptions of people who were living in poverty are particularly jarring considering his own life. In the first decade of the 1900s, he faced legal action over non-payment of debts, although we don't have a lot of details on what this case involved. In 1907, when he was 47, he went to the United States, and that may have been at least partially motivated by wanting to get away from both his financial situation and possible lawsuits over it. He also might have thought that he could make more money in the United States, where the market wasn't already just flooded with copies of his work. Initially, this was supposed to be a four-month trip, but he wound up staying for three years. In the U.S., Wayne worked for Hearst Newspapers, and he did a lot of events and other work with organizations dedicated to cats, including American Cat Fancy. He reportedly decided to invest in a new type of oil lamp, one that was supposed to be remarkably efficient, but which did not pan out. This may have really happened, but he also still didn't have much money. So if he lost it all, he was going from a little money to even less money. It wasn't as though he was going from having a fortune to having nothing. Yeah, sometimes sources make it sound like he had a big break and he blew it, but it that's a little exaggerated for what really happened. Louis Wayne left the U.S. in 1910 after getting word that his mother was dying. And after he left, he faced some criticism in American newspapers. Most of this was related to criticisms he had made of the United States, like pointing out the contradiction of Americans praising the effort of millionaires to fund things like hospitals and institutes, while also condemning the idea of everyone paying their fair share in taxes to fund these kinds of efforts more equitably for everyone. Or pointing out the way a lot of immigrants were shut out of job opportunities and forced into poverty but then disparaged for being poor. At the same time, though, some of the things that reporters harped on when they were criticizing him were really taken out of context or flatly untrue. Sadly, Louis Wayne's mother died before he got back to the UK. His sister Marie also died a few years later on March 3rd, 1913. She had never left the asylum after she had been institutionalized. In 1914, Wayne produced a set of ceramics known as the Futurist Cats, which also included a pig and a bulldog. These were brightly colored ceramic figures. They're kind of abstract, so sometimes they're called the Cubist Cats. They clearly were inspired by the Cubist movement. Wayne registered nine designs for these, and about 20 designs were actually made. They were produced by Max Emanuel and Company and possibly were also commissioned by that firm. There is another bit of lore about the futurist cats, which is that Wayne put all his money into making them, only to lose it all when the ship that they were being transported on was sunk by a German torpedo. This is pretty hard to substantiate, though. While some of the cats were made in Austria or Czechoslovakia, Others were made in the UK, so it's unlikely that the entire stock would have been all on one ship. There's no record of what ship may have gone down with them aboard, whether it was a ship from continental Europe to the UK, or perhaps a ship headed to the United States. On October 7th of 1914, Louis Wayne fell while trying to board a bus, and he was knocked unconscious. He sustained a concussion and had to be hospitalized, and after this, doctors advised him to rest for six months. Eventually, this event, like so many other things in his life, was also mythologized. The story became that he had fallen because the bus driver swerved to avoid a cat. 
Wayne had always been an anxious, cautious, and shy person, and during World War I, he became even more so. His work had been enormously popular for decades, but the war made it harder for him to find work, both because of lack of money to pay for things like illustrators and shortages of paper. In 1917, the Wayne family moved from Westgate-on-Sea to Kilburn, and that same year, his oldest sister, Caroline, died at the age of 53 from influenza that had progressed into pneumonia. Louis' sister, Felice, got a job in an office to try to help the family make ends meet. Both Felice and Claire were doing artwork of their own, but they really focused on supporting their brother's career rather than trying to sell their own work. In 1917, Louis was also commissioned to work on some cartoons, but unfortunately, the vast majority of those have been lost. I'm deeply curious about what they may have been like. The dream. The last Louis Wayne annual came out in 1921, and the 1920s also marked a major shift in Wayne's life. Developments in cameras, halftone printing, and photographic plate making, and methods to transmit photos over telegraph wires had made it much easier and less expensive to print photographs in newspapers and magazines. So publishers increasingly relied on photographers, not illustrators. Wayne had more and more trouble finding paying work, and since the UK market was already flooded with his illustrations, none of them protected by copyright, it was harder for him to sell new pictures. His behavior also started to become more erratic. He talked about being plagued by spirits that were somehow electrical. His colleagues at Cat Fancy became alarmed when he started talking about a big cat show they were organizing, but that show didn't actually exist. At home, he started compulsively rearranging the furniture, sometimes in the middle of the night. He also became really paranoid and started to accuse his sisters of stealing from him. His behavior toward them was increasingly hostile, and at different points, his sisters described him grabbing and shoving them. He also wrote letters to his friends that described his sisters in really belligerent and abusive terms. By 1924, Louis' sisters didn't feel safe with him at home, and they contacted a doctor. Although it had really been in the previous couple of years that Louis' behavior had become more alarming, his sisters told the doctor he had started behaving strangely after that fall from the bus a decade before. It is possible that his behavior did change after that accident, but describing a physical injury as the start of someone's mental illness was also really really common at this point. It sort of alleviated a little bit of the stigma that was associated with mental illness. Louis was declared insane and taken to Springfield Hospital in Tooting, where he was admitted to the pauper's ward. We are going to talk about his life in hospitals after we pause for a sponsor break. Various historians and biographers contradict one another regarding Louis Wayne's diagnosis. I read a lot of resources for this, and some of them said directly opposite things. Some say that he was diagnosed with schizophrenia or with an illness that would be called schizophrenia by today's terms. Others definitively say that he was never formally diagnosed with schizophrenia. I don't know which of these is correct, Either way, though, schizophrenia was known as an illness at this point. German psychiatrist Emil Kraepelin had first described it as dementia praecox in the late 19th century, and Swiss psychiatrist Eugen Bleuler had refined that description and coined the term schizophrenia in 1908. After Louis was hospitalized, Claire and Felicie started trying to support themselves by offering drawing lessons. They also visited Louis every week along with their sister Josephine, bringing him art supplies and treats when they could afford it. While they were there, they would look at what he had drawn since their last visit, and they'd take whatever seemed likely to sell to help support them all. About a year after Wayne was admitted to the hospital, journalist and bookseller Dan Ryder was touring the asylum and recognized him by his drawing. He started telling other people that Louis Wayne was in a pauper's ward, and that sparked a huge effort to raise money so that he could be moved to a better hospital. 
and to try to financially support his sisters. Initially, the goal for this effort was to raise a thousand pounds. One of the biggest organizers of this effort was Ada Elizabeth Chesterton, writing under the name Mrs. Cecil Chesterton. In an appeal for funds, she wrote, quote, Louis Wayne is in a pauper lunatic asylum. This must come as a shock to the many thousands who have loved and admired his work. For years, Louis Wayne's cats decorated our hoardings, adorned the covers of our magazines, and were familiarly loved by every child and the majority of grown-ups. No Christmas calendar was complete without this artist. No annual was issued that did not contain one of his vivid sketches. And yet, at the age of 65, he is so bereft of means that in his affliction, he is compelled to accept the hospitality of a state institution. Only about 275 pounds had been raised when Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald stepped in and arranged for Wayne to be transferred to Bethlehem Royal Hospital on August 24th of 1925. Some sources say that this was the work of Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin. MacDonald and Baldwin alternately served as Prime Minister from 1923 to 1937, so it's likely that each of them were involved in different points. Three days after Wayne was transferred, H.G. Wells broadcast a personal message via radio saying of Louis Wayne, quote, he has made the cat his own. He invented a cat style, a cat society, a whole cat world. English cats that do not look and live like Louis Wayne cats are ashamed of themselves. The Daily Graphic hosted a Louis Wayne drawing competition. The magazine Animals turned its September 1925 issue into a Louis Wayne fundraiser. After raising 1,500 pounds, the Louis Wayne Fund raised its goal to 3,000. Louis's surviving sisters, who were now in their late 50s to late 60s, seem to have felt conflicted about all of this. The three of them were trying to support themselves while also keeping their home mostly as it had been while Louis was living there. They thought it would really break his heart if they moved or if they started selling off their possessions. So they were glad that their brother was in a nicer hospital and that they were also getting some financial help. But they were not consulted about any of this. They felt like they were alternately patronized and ignored by various fundraisers It's also not clear what happened to all of the money that was raised, although a lot of it did go to support Louis and his sisters. Almost 400 pounds of it seemed to have just apparently vanished. Yeah, I imagine this is uh, pre a lot of laws regarding how you can handle charity and fundraiser events, Mm -hmm. which would now make that a little bit more uh, difficult to just vanish big chunks of it. Bethlehem Hospital was also known as Bedlam, a term associated with chaos and confusion. And like many psychiatric hospitals, Bethlehem had a reputation for horrific conditions for centuries. That was something that was exacerbated by a policy of allowing the general public to basically come in and gawk under the idea that seeing mentally ill people in this kind of situation would offer some kind of moral instruction and act as a cautionary tale. But in the 19th century, the hospital had faced hearings and investigations, and it had moved to what was known as the moral model of care that was focused on humane treatment of patients, moral instruction, rest, routine, and light work. Obviously, this did not solve all issues involved with psychiatric care, but it was a big step forward from what had been before Louis Wayne was given a private room and supplied with art materials, and he continued to make new art. He seems to have become a lot less agitated. He was no longer violent, although people still thought he was delusional. He talked about things like feeling like he was filled with electricity and believing that he could use that electricity to heal people by laying on of hands. In October and November of 1925, a fundraising exhibition of Louis's work was held at 21 Gallery in London, and it included new work that he had done while living at Bethlehem. The exhibition catalog, called Souvenir of Louis Wayne's Work, sold thousands of copies and went into four printings. One Christmas, Louis and other patients were invited to decorate the hospital, and he painted the surface of a mirror with a picture of one cat giving another a Christmas pudding. This painted mirror became part of the hospital's annual Christmas decor. 
Wayne also started producing artwork that some sources have interpreted as being reflective of his mental illness. In addition to drawing cats, he drew vibrantly colored and very detailed landscapes. Sometimes their color palette is a little bit strange. It's almost hyper-real, and it can be a little bit jarring in the juxtaposition of colors. Sometimes this is interpreted as a decline in his artistic ability. But Louis was also working with whatever art materials other people gave him. It wasn't as though he had picked these things out for himself. He also was not allowed to have a sharpener. Also, while his sisters were still selling what could be sold, it's possible that he no longer felt as much pressure to produce saleable work. In addition to money from the Louis Wayne Fund, the Prime Minister had arranged for his sisters to receive a small pension, so he just may have felt like he had more creative room to play. This is also when some of Wayne's cat pictures started to become more abstract. There were cats whose faces were surrounded by layers and layers of colorful, somewhat zigzaggy, almost electrical lines, or pictures of highly kaleidoscopic cats whose features are embellished with detailed, repeating geometric shapes, or cats with these faces that are perfectly symmetrical and just made up of very colorful, repetitive, almost fractal-like details. These are the ones that became an influence for the psychedelic art of the 1960s. They also really resemble computer-generated representations of fractals, although those did not exist until the 1970s. These more abstract pictures became associated with Louis Wayne's mental illness, and with schizophrenia specifically, not long after his death. Psychologist Walter McClay found several of his pictures at a junk shop in 1939. McClay arranged them in an order that suggested a progression from a wide-eyed, fluffy cat on a repeating geometric background to a less realistic cat surrounded by concentric, jagged lines to a symmetrical, kaleidoscope-like pattern of colors that barely suggest the features of a cat. He interpreted this as illustrating the progression of schizophrenia. It makes sense that McClay would make this connection. The year before, he and his colleague Eric Gutman had given a group of artists the hallucinogenic drug mescaline, which was believed to induce a mental state similar to schizophrenia, and then they had told them to record their experiences on mescaline as artwork. Some of what these artists produced had some traits in common with Louis Wayne's kaleidoscope cats, like repeating elements and bright colors that didn't quite go together and geometric shapes. There are some problems with this interpretation, though. For one, none of the pictures are dated, so we have no idea whether Louis Wayne created them in the order that McClay arranged them. Two, as he was doing these drawings, he was also still doing illustrations that were more like what he had done before entering the hospital. Sometimes he's characterized as exclusively drawing progressively more abstract cats, but that is not what happened. In May of 1930, Louis Wayne was moved to Knapsbury Hospital near St. Albans. Bethlehem Hospital also moved locations in 1930. Some accounts say that Wayne's move was because the hospital was relocating, but others describe it as just following an assessment of how he was doing. It's also possible that that assessment was part of the decision-making process into where patients should go after the hospital moved. Knapsbury was in a wooded area with a courtyard and a garden and lots of cats. In that aspect, it seems like it would have been a good fit for Louis Wayne. But he was also getting older, which seems to have been affecting both his physical health and his cognitive abilities. He sometimes would lose track of who he was talking to or become so tired in the middle of a conversation that he could not continue. He also broke his collarbone in a fall after being tripped by another patient. He was still creating, though. Another exhibition of his work was held in 1931 as a fundraiser for his sisters. By this point, Josephine had developed severe arthritis and could no longer make the trip, but Claire and Felicie still visited him regularly and they still gathered up whatever art was able to be sold. Wayne painted Christmas decorations onto mirrors at Knapsbury Hospital as well, some of which have been preserved. He published his last book in 1934. In 1936, he had a stroke that affected his speech and caused weakness on his right side, but he was still able to draw afterward. 
The last exhibition of his artwork to take place during his lifetime was in June of 1937 at Clarendon House, London. Louis' sister Josephine died on January 14, 1939. Because of her own health, he hadn't seen her in years, and his surviving sisters decided it would be best not to tell him that she had died, although he did ask why she had stopped writing to him. Louis Wayne died at Knapsbury Hospital on July 4, 1939, at the age of 78, and was buried at St. Mary's Catholic Cemetery alongside his father and two of his sisters. During his lifetime, he had illustrated more than 200 books, many of which he also wrote. There were also postcards of his work printed all over Europe and North America and thousands of individual works of art. One article published just after his death said of him, quote, Louis Wayne's cats were once as familiar in British households particularly as Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck are today. Frank Bernand, editor of Punch magazine, called Louis Wayne the Hogarth of cat life, and also said of him, quote, his reasoning is so original, so imaginative, and so reverent. You say to yourself, here is a man who thinks his own thoughts, a man who is determined to live every moment of his life so that he and others may be the wiser and better for it. A Louis Wayne memorial exhibition was held in September of 1939, in part to benefit his two surviving sisters. Felicie died in 1940, and Claire died in 1945. An exhibition of his work was held at the Victoria and Albert Museum in 1972 and 1973. A biopic called The Electrical Life of Louis Wayne came out in 2021, starring Benedict Cumberbatch as Louis and Claire Foy as Emily. An exhibition of his work was also held at the Bethlehem Museum of the Mind from December of 2021 to April of 2022, and that was called Animal Therapy, the Cats of Louis Wayne. There has been some speculation in more recent years about whether or not Louis Wayne had schizophrenia. Even if he had been diagnosed with it, a lot has changed in the nearly a century since that would have happened. Of course, it is not possible to accurately diagnose a person who is not here to examine. But various medical historians, psychiatrists, and biographers have noted that schizophrenia can affect a person's motor skills, including their fine motor skills. But Wayne's later work is still extremely detailed and precise. Also, most of the time, schizophrenia develops by early adulthood, and while Wayne was described as anxious and eccentric and depressed much of his life, the symptoms that led his sisters to seek psychiatric treatment for him seem to have started when he was in his late 50s or early 60s. In 2002, psychiatrist Michael Fitzgerald published a letter in the Irish Journal of Psychiatric Medicine that offered a different interpretation, which was that Louis Wayne had Asperger's syndrome, or, to use the more modern terminology, that he was autistic. Fitzgerald noted traits like Wayne's social isolation, unusual tone of voice, and preservation of sameness. The term Asperger's syndrome was coined in 1981 based on a 1944 treatise by Hans Asperger. The term Autism was coined in the early 20th century, so that was in use while Louis Wayne was alive. But at first, it was used to describe a childhood form of schizophrenia. Its meaning did not start to shift toward the way that it is used today until the 1940s uh, after Louis Wayne's death. So neither of these terms would have been around while he was in the hospital. Other possibilities are a lot more speculative. For example, people have pointed out similarities between Louis Wayne's kaleidoscopic cats and the artwork of Canadian scientist Anne Adams, who created brightly colored visual depictions of Ravel's bolero after developing a degenerative neurological disorder. Yeah, regardless of any of that. Boy, do I love these pictures. Kitties! (laughs) Kitties! Do you love some listener mail, too? I do. I have listener mail from Kristen. Uh, Initially, at the beginning of this email, Kristen talked about um, E. Pauline Johnson's poems featured in a series of piano lesson books. So it was like a name that that Kristen uh, recognized immediately. This is a series of books that's been around for many decades, and if you find the older ones, 
Uh, they are Faber and Faber's Piano Adventures. Uh, the older ones are a little dated and insensitive, um, unsurprisingly. Kristen went on to say, I also am a big fan of L.M. Montgomery. And although the Anne of Green Gables books are wonderful, it's the Emily series that I adore so much that I named my oldest daughter Emily. I finally put together that Montgomery grew up in Canada at the same time that Johnson was publishing her poetry and making a living through her writing. I would imagine she was a great inspiration to the young author, as the closing poem that you read is very similar in style and subject, natural beauty, to much of Montgomery's writing. The main theme of the Emily books is a young Canadian woman striving to make her career through publishing her writing, and then to realize that the E initial in Johnson's name actually stands for Emily. What a fun connection to make, mind blown. Kristen then said, no pets here, only allergies, with a little sad face emoji. Thanks for your great work, Kristen. Thanks for this email, Kristen. I had meant to say, and I don't think that I did, that when I was doing research uh, into the the Pauline Johnson episode, one of the things I found was a controversy that had happened in schools in very recent years uh, when a school performed a song that was based on a Pauline Johnson poem, and there were concerns about whether it was uh, racially or ethnically insensitive and that reminded me of the, the start of this email that was about, like, the dated-slash-insensitive piano lesson books um, drawn from, among other things, Pauline Johnson's work. And aside from that, I just wanted to put it out there again that uh, that L.M. Montgomery is on my list for an episode sometime. But I super just want to have an excuse to take a vacation to Prince Edward Island and that general region of Canada first, because it feels very close to me living in Boston. It's not, actually. It's kind of far, but... uh, It's closer than it it would be from Atlanta. Much closer than if I were still living in Atlanta. So, um, So thank you so much, Kristen, for this email. If you would like to send us a note about this or any other podcast... We're at History Podcasts at iHeartRadio.com, and we're also all over social media as Mr. in History. That's where you'll find our Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, and you can subscribe to our show on the iHeartRadio app or wherever else you get your podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.